Hello all and welcome. My name is Margaret. I am a historical customer and textile conservator in training. And today we are doing the second video in a series, sort of my introduction to art conservation. The first video in this series is what is an art conservator? You can of course go to my channel, link up here and link down there and watch that video. The other videos in the series, I'll be talking about my own art conservation journey. And if there's enough interest, a fourth video on all things art conservation, you can of course leave your questions down below subscribe to this channel, head over to my Instagram page, ask questions there, all that jazz, all the standard YouTube stuff, subscribe, like, do all that stuff. Anyway, ask questions if you want to. But today we're going to be talking about how one goes about becoming an art conservator and sort of the pros and cons of the field at large. I just want to say starting off here, a lot of these are my opinions when it comes to the pros and cons, but also I don't intend to be negative in this video. I just want to be realistic. There are many different ways of being an art conservator and many different ways of living life as an art conservator, but there are some realities that need to be stated if you are thinking about pursuing this field. So we're going to talk about sort of the pipeline process of how you get into grad school and become an art conservator. We're also going to talk about the pros and cons of the field and some of the realities surrounding that. So stay tuned. It has long been said to me and to many others, that pursuing art conservation is not a sprint, but in fact a marathon. So let's strap on our running shoes and get going. I don't know if you strap on, I normally tie on my running shoes, but let's go. So when people approach me and they're like, how do you become an art conservator? Here are the first two things I always tell them. One, do your research, figure out if this field is something you're even interested in pursuing. So this, of course, this video is a great place to start. Hi, step one, you're here. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to our conservators in your area, do some informational interviews or lab tours. That's fabulous. You can also go to the links in the description, the different program links and other things that I'll put down there, sort of give you a start. The EPC on Facebook page is also a place you can go to ask questions. Mileage may vary on the EPC on Facebook page, but you can of course look at AIC, ICOMCC, read a couple of papers, see what this entire career is about. And then once you've determined, hey, this is something that I think I might want to do, the second thing I really encourage people to do, and this is more difficult, is to find an internship, preferably a bench conservation internship, but it could also be a collections care internship, something that interfaces with the museum, it could be with a private conservator, a job shadow, that kind of thing, because you need to know two things. If you can do this, and if you want to do this. Art conservation has a very specific set of hand skills and a very specific sort of set of working parameters, mainly that if you're an art conservator, you have to love doing treatment. You've got to love sitting and picking at things for like hours on end. I spent all of yesterday, like eight hours, meticulously sewing slits closed on a tapestry. And I've been doing that for weeks and I love it. Like that's my happy place. Like I hand sew all day at work. I come home, I hand sew all day at home. There are so many videos in this channel of me hand sewing after a long day of work. So I love it, but not everyone does. I remember my dad telling me this story. He thought he wanted to be an accountant. He had a single accounting internship and was like, hate it. Having an internship in conservation can really help you to understand if this is something you want to do and something you want to move forward and give a lot of resources to because it requires a lot of resources to get into conservation, unfortunately. So those are the two places I would start. If you can't get an internship right away, keep looking, do job shadows, figure it out. Just know that this is something you want to pursue. Know that this is something you can and want to do. Because I've met some people who, you know, have an internship and they're like, I actually hate this. So figure that out first. So now that you've determined that, yes, this is something I want to do, it's time to talk about graduate degree. In this day and age, if you want to work in a museum, or a large private practice or a regional lab, you need a graduate degree in conservation. Many decades ago, you could be a bench trained conservator and essentially apprentice up to becoming a full fledged art conservator with like a job in a major museum. Those days for the most part are gone. There are a couple of bench trained conservators who work in private practice that has been sort of like family owned for many, many years. And there is sort of this movement somewhat within the conservation field to sort of bring back apprenticeships in one way or another. But as it stands right now, 
if you want to be an art conservator, you need a master's degree. You don't need a PhD, but you do need a master's degree. Most conservators have a master's degree. Some of us has PhDs. It's a whole nother topic. That means you need to get into a master's program, which means you need to fulfill certain requirements to get into those master's programs. It's a lot. This period sort of between when you figure out you want to become an art conservator and your graduate program is often referred to as the quote pre-program space, a pre-program internship, a pre-program student. Not everyone likes the pre-program label, but it is the most widely used. So we are going to use it in this video because that is what you're going to see the majority of the time. So broadly speaking, these are the requirements to get into these sort of big conservation programs in the United States. I should have denoted this, but you could probably tell from my accent. I am specifically going to be talking about the United States. There are many programs throughout the globe in conservation, but these are the requirements for a United States graduate program. Broadly speaking, they have changed in recent years. I will be linking the pages down below. So check those out, especially if you're coming to this video several years after, check the requirements. But broadly speaking, this is what is required to get into a conservation graduate program. Number one, an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's of science, art, a BIS, or a BFA, one of those, okay? From an accredited institution. We will talk about undergraduate degrees in just a second. Don't worry if it's not in art or science or something, you just need an undergraduate degree. Second one, you need specific coursework requirements. This includes six, five to six, courses in art history, anthropology, museum studies, or other sort of very related fields, archaeology, um, etc. Art history is the most common requirement. So if you are going to be taking classes, <laughs> art history probably is good. They do need to be upper level, most of them, I believe. Again, look at the links. The second courses that you have to take are chemistry courses. Almost all conservation programs require at least general chemistry, but the, the sort of the big funded programs, they want you to have four chemistry courses. This includes Gen Chem 1, Gen Chem 2, O Chem 1, and O Chem 2. Sometimes that fourth class can be sort of a swing, so figure it out, all with corresponding lab sections. There's sort of a debate whether online chemistry courses count. So if you can take them in person, take them in person. And the third group of classes is art. So you need like four-ish studio art classes, normally a drawing, normally a painting, some type of 3D, and then like a miscellaneous class. Now that brings us in to the conservation internship portion. You need at least 400 hours of conservation internship or sort of associated collections care internship. As long as you can like sell it as having our conservation skills, it kind of counts, but bench conservation internships are by far preferred. And also, as we talked about previously, you should at least do one bench conservation internship before deciding to become a conservator, like going in whole hog, because trust me, you need to know if you like doing this work. The other requirements are two portfolios. First, an art portfolio, showing off your hand skills and your art skills. They often have different sort of art styles or art types that you need to hit, like a drawing, a painting, a photograph, etc. Again, look at the specific requirements of the programs you're going to apply to. And then also a conservation portfolio of different treatments that you have done with their associated reports and documentation. That's a lot. It's less than it used to be, which is crazy. So all that to say, this can take some time, which is why pre-program is a selection of years, normally one to nine years, depending on sort of the rate of doing these things or whether or not you found this in undergrad, etc., etc. So let's talk about undergrad. If you are in fact lucky enough to find art conservation either before or during your undergrad, you're in a great spot. That means you can sort of tailor your classes to what you need to fulfill those requirements that we just talked about. I started pursuing art conservation, I would say in my junior year of my undergrad. We'll talk about my specific art conservation story in the next video, but it was very, very helpful in doing my specific, specific requirements for my um, graduate application. Don't fear though, you don't necessarily need to have 
a undergraduate degree in a specific field to become an art conservator. You just need to hit all those requirements. So I've met people with Russian literature degrees who become conservators. I've met people with like physics degrees who become conservators. Like there's a ton of different undergraduate degrees in this field and that is totally okay. However, the most helpful undergraduate degrees in fulfilling those requirements are going to be art history, chemistry, studio art, those three. Um, archaeology can also be helpful, anthropology can also be helpful, history can also be helpful, museum studies can also be helpful. Um, if you're doing textiles, a fashion degree can also be helpful. Something that helps you fulfill those requirements. Now what I'm about to tell you is very, very important to listen up. If you are in high school and you are looking for an undergraduate institution, there are specific institutions that have art conservation undergraduate degrees. University of Delaware has one. I believe there's one in Colorado. There's a couple around the country. If it makes financial sense to go to one of those institutions, go for it. But do not, do not go into a lot of debt for your undergraduate degree. Don't do it. Go to something that is relatively affordable for you because art conservators do not make a ton of money. We're going to talk about this. Our conservators, we're not doctors, we're not lawyers. We don't make a ton of money. You want to minimize your student loans as much as possible. It is really, really going to be helpful for you. So if it makes financial sense to go to get a specific art conservation undergraduate degree that is going to help you with finding internships, is going to give you very specific tailored education, that is fabulous. You do not need to do that, okay? You don't need to do that. Seriously, minimize debt. I went to a large state school that was in my budget and I was able to get into art conservation school just fine. I know people who spent a lot of money on their undergraduate degrees and were in the same place. It's like, it's completely fine. Seriously, don't go into too much student debt. It's really not worth it for your undergraduate degree. It's really not worth it. Um, I will say the whole doing generals at community college before going to a four year university that can work, you know, if that's something you want to pursue, okay. However, networking is a really, really important part of this field and networking is a really, really important part of your undergraduate degree. And I find going to a four-year institution for all four years to be very beneficial in networking with um, different conservators, networking with different professors, getting those recommendations. So again, do what suits your budget, but don't like, I know when you're like 17, 18 and like I was there, you like have see these programs and you're like, oh my God, like I really want to go to that program. This is going to be so perfect for me. But it's like a quarter of a million dollars versus like 70. Seriously, don't, don't go into debt. Do not do it. Okay. Don't do it. Now, when you're in your undergrad at your an institution that you can hopefully afford, just try to take as many classes that fit into your requirements as possible. Obviously, it depends on the institution. I went to a super big school. They had everything I needed. I was in the honors program. They let me kind of do whatever I want. It's fabulous. Um, so I did basically almost all of my coursework during my undergrad, except for OCHEM 2 and my art classes. We'll talk about it in the next video. You do are not an undergrad and you don't have all your course requirements fulfilled. You do need to pay out of pocket for those, unfortunately. You need to get them from an accredited institution. That can be a community college. I personally took all of my art classes at a community college and it was fine. It was a wild ride, but you know, I got into grad school, so we're good. So that is something that you are unfortunately going to have to do. It takes a while. A lot of people, that's why they stay in pre-program for a long time is because they do have to pay for these classes. And it does take a little bit of time to save the money, pay for the classes, take the classes, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just going to put a pin in this. In previous years, many of the programs had the GRE as a requirement. That has mostly been taken out. Make sure to note whether or not you have to take the GRE. If you do, I'm so sorry. If you don't, that's fab. I had to take the GRE. It's um, not my favorite, as you can probably tell. The next thing is the internship hours. Internships can be very difficult to get, I understand. I did four different internships. A lot of people have many different internships throughout their pre-program years. Internships, you're either going to find them at museums. So like look on museum websites, get on the EPCN like list where they like list all the pre-program internships. I'll link it down below. You can also connect with private practice people in your area and see if you can get a shadow with them or an internship with them. Um, and you can also look at 
many other sort of adjacent fields like collections care or just being in a museum in general is helpful. Internships, unfortunately, don't pay very well. Or sometimes they don't pay at all. There's a big push in the field to not have unpaid work because that shouldn't be a thing, but it has been a thing for a very long time because unfortunately museums are on budgets and oftentimes internship programs don't fall within those budgets. However, there's a big push within the field to have only unpaid interns, which is great. That does create this weird kind of era we're in right now, like this post COVID, like, like, are we in a recession period where they don't want to have unpaid internships, but they also don't really have the money to pay interns. So they're not having internships kind of thing right now. It's really frustrating. I'm so, I feel for you guys. Most people have to move at least once or twice for internships. I know people who have moved across the country several times for different positions. I personally relocated for an internship um, for a couple of months and that can be really, really frustrating and that can be really, really expensive. And this is when art conservation can get a little frustrating is because you do need these internship hours to get into grad school. And a lot of people applying have over like thousands of hours of internship or, or associated like tech conservation tech positions um, under their belts. So there are, there is a push to be taking people like that 400 hour minimum. Like that is like, they'll be like, they really want to start taking people around that 400 hour mark, but there are only so many spots and we can talk about this. So just try to get those 400 hours. Some of them bench, some of them can be, you know, associated things. With that being said, a lot of the times you're just going to have a part-time internship, maybe full-time for a couple of months and then maybe part-time. I know I was part-time for about two years at one of my internship sites. If you're lucky enough, there are conservation tech positions that don't require a graduate degree that a lot of pre-program interns do get. So these are like full-time jobs um, where you are actually doing conservation work as a tech, account making positions, all that jazz. So keep a lookout for those. Most likely, you will also have to be working a job that pays you during this period of time. So I would suggest to try to get a job that expands your hand skills or gets you to interface with art conservators or other museum employees, or honestly just makes you really a lot of money. I worked at a bridal shop doing hand sewing, which was a great use for my skills and you know, helped build my hand sewing skills. But you know, I've had friends who worked at pay framing shops. I've had friends who just made a crap ton of money as a bartender. Like you're probably going to have another job during this period. So, you know, try to look for something that's associated, but also at the end of the day, you got to pay your bills. So do what you need to do. Also keep in mind that the different specialities of conservation that we talked about in the last video, again, go watch it. You don't necessarily need to be doing your internships in your specific specialty. It actually is preferred that you have a wide range of experience. So even though I knew that I was going to do textile conservation, I did an objects internship, I did a paper internship, and those did help me expand my skills and helped me to be able to talk about why specifically I want to do textiles. You know, and you might be surprised, you know, you might be like me and be like, no, I'm never changing. I did these internships and I know textiles are for me, but maybe you're like, I want to be a textile conservator. You're like, oh my God, I loved that book and paper internship. Like I loved it so much. Like I'm going to do book and paper more power to you. Cause that's where all the jobs are. Be flexible in internships. You're not married to the things you do in internships. The point of the internship is twofold. One we've talked about to decide, you know, what you want to do, build your skills, that kind of thing, but also networking. Internships are going to plug you into the network of conservators. This is a small field. Okay. So it's going to plug you into the network and really going to help you build those connections, which you are going to need. Okay. You are going to need those connections. So make sure to make them when you're at your internship site. Meet as many people as possible. Go on lab tours, really take advantage of that network and that internship site. Now, as I've said, this sort of pre program cycle can last a while because guess what? Grad school is hard to get into. Many people apply more than once to get into grad school. That is not uncommon. It is actually uncommon to get in on the first try. So don't get discouraged. Keep on at it. Um, but also, you know, be realistic with yourself. If you don't want to be in pre-program forever, like I know I set myself a limit. I'm like, I'm going to apply twice. If I don't get in, I'm going to pursue something else. I got in, so we didn't go down the other road, but you know, just be real with yourself. 
set the timeline that you want to set and do what you need to do. Really, this is all about understanding this field and understanding what this field is so you can make informed decisions about how you want your life to be. Let's talk about applications and schools in general. Let's talk about school and applications. So again, we're focusing on United States based programs in the United States and in North America generally, we have the NAGPIC conference, and that is a consortium of many different schools that are conservation, art conservation, and historic preservation related schools. Not every conservation school is in a NAGPIC, which we will talk about really quick, but that is a good place to start. Here's where we're gonna talk about money, okay? Some graduate programs are fully funded and you get a stipend and you get your tuition comped. Some programs you have to pay tuition and you don't get a stipend. Some it's somewhere in the middle. These are all questions you should be asking because again, finances is an important part of this. For some people, it is more financially viable to choose a program that is not funded because the requirements are lower and they don't have to pay for those requirements. For someone like me, it was more financially viable to get the requirements to go to a school that was funded. Again, do what works for you go into as little debt as possible. It always comes down to the money. We know it always comes down to the money. So don't feel bad if that's why you're making the decision. That's why a lot of people make these decisions. Let's talk about the schools. So in the United States, there are four, count them, four large funded conservation programs. Number one, it's the Winter University of Delaware program in art conservation. They're the only one known for having a textile conservation of these four programs. They also have furniture. They're very well known for furniture. Objects, photo, book, paper, painting. I'm missing one. Somebody's going to be mad at me. We basically have everything. And there's also, of course, Buffalo. They don't have a textile program, but some textile conservators come out of there. They have objects, they have paintings, they have book paper. There's NYU, which is a slightly, slightly different. It's a four-year program where you also get an MA in art history, as well as an MS in conservation. They are known for time-based media. They every once in a while put out a textile conservator, but it's very rare. And they also have, you know, objects, paper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That program is a bit different from Buffalo and Winneter. So again, talk to people, ask questions, do your research on that one. Then there's also UCLA Getty, specifically focuses on archaeological conservation. They go every other year, so they accept students every other year, and they also accept less students. So whereas Buffalo and Winneter take 10, NYU takes up to 10, but normally more around the six to eight mark. UCLA Getty only takes about five or six every two years. There are a couple other options for textile specific conservation programs, those being the FIT program and RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. FIT has put out a lot of textile conservators. I only know of a couple textile conservators out of RISD, but that is a possibility. These programs, to my knowledge, are not funded. And so you're gonna to have to figure out finances. Do your research on those programs. I'm not gonna go into the differences between the programs and the politics associated with that because one, it's really inside baseball. And two, to be honest, the people, people pick these programs for different reasons and they're all valid. And I'm not here to have, like, I don't have any opinions on people who pick either or, like, it's fine. Like, it, it really depends on the person I have met amazing conservators from FIT, I've met amazing conservators from Winneter. Textiles conservators from the U.S. also do sometimes go over to the Glasgow program at uh, the University of Glasgow. They have a textile conservation program there. Again, many great conservators who've been over there. I've been to Glasgow. It's lovely over there. I will say though, and this is universal, if you want to work in the U.S., go to school in the U.S. If you want to work in the U.K., go to school in the U.K. If you want to work in Canada, go to school in Canada because it's about network and who you know, okay? Very important. So although people have sort of jumped, gone to school in Glasgow and come back to the US and it's been totally chill and fine, just know that it is a good idea to sort of stick in the country that you wanna work in and do internships in the country that you wanna work in because that is going to be very helpful in building your network overall. There are a couple of other programs I want to talk about. First is the Queen's program up in Canada for my Canadian viewers. To be honest, I don't know a ton about that program. I do know a couple people from that program. I think the requirements might be a little less than some of the schools in the United States. There are also some heritage preservation programs. The ones in a NAGPIC are UPenn, Harvard, and Columbia. And those are primarily more 
architectural in nature, like building preservation. I also don't know a ton about those presentations or those schools. Again, links will be down below. I seriously like, I, I know about Winneter and FIT and that's kind of it because those were the two I was really looking into. You can ask me questions about Winneter, sometimes about FIT. Otherwise, go do your research, go ask people who actually know. It's complex and it, the choice is really difficult. So now you're ready to apply, congratulations. Don't apply before you have all the requirements for a specific program because you won't get an interview. Applications are normally due late December, early January with interview requests going out in February, March, interviews being at the end of March, early April, and then decisions April, May. First part of the application is just like any sort of grad school application. You send in your requirements, you send in your transcripts, you send in your little essays. If you are applying, make sure to lean on the people around you, your internship supervisors, your other pre-program friends, get those sent off. You and do end up getting an interview. Congratulations. Now it's time to start getting all that stuff ready, which can include a presentation of past preservation treatments. It can include your portfolios, sometimes a science exam questionnaire situation, and a couple of other different things which the program will walk you through. Oftentimes the program will give you a, like a buddy, a current student buddy, to sort of ask questions to and prep with, but make sure to prep with your supervisors or your conservation mentors. They're very, very helpful great. Again, tap into your network. That is like the most important thing in this entire field is like tap into your network, build a network and tap into it. I had a lovely internship supervisor slash mentor who helped me a lot with the process and really brought other people in to help me as well. So lean on those people. It's a big deal. Most programs, I would say interview maybe 30 ish people. And again, we talked about how many they take depends on the program up to 10, I would say pretty rough practice. And if you get in, fabulous, welcome to grad school. If you don't, try again, figure it out, you'll be okay. I think it's really important to state here that there are so many qualified people applying to these positions. And you honestly, if you get rejected, it's not because you're not qualified, it's not because you're not a good conservator. It, it honestly, there are just 10 other people that they wanted to take and it really doesn't reflect on your skills or your validity as a human being. It just, sometimes it's not your day and that sucks. And um, I totally get that. So if you do get into a program, again, congrats. Now you are in the quote unquote program stage of your art conservation journey. Obviously different programs are different. Make sure, you know, it's a time to utilize your resources, to utilize their networks, to really dig in and meet people and make connections and do your research and figure out what you're good at and figure out what kinds of things you want to do and figure out where you want to work and just take advantage of the entire situation take advantage of the resources being given you grow your network so basically the two things to take away from this video i would say are like don't go into debt and grow your network it can be a lot but it's also a really really amazing time as well now let's talk a bit about post programs the fun doesn't stop once you get out of graduate school um, a lot of people right out of graduate school will take what are called fellowship positions. And these are normally grant funded positions within a institution where you do a research project or sort of a large treatment for your continued education and portfolio development. So there you go. There's that. They don't pay very well, but they are a thing. And then hopefully one can find a job after that, I'm sort of in that position right now where I'm applying to fellowships and jobs and it's, um, it's kind of stressful, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, conservation, the job pool can be somewhat limited and this is sort of where we're gonna go into the pros and cons of this career. So let's talk about the cons first because I do wanna get it out of the way and also I feel like I've just been giving you a lot of information I wanna synthesize it. So one of the cons of this field and of this career is the job opportunities. There are a limited amount of jobs in museums. It's just the case. There's a limited amount of funding and there's a limited amount of jobs and it can be very, very hard to get a full-time position. I know conservators out of program, normally it takes, it can take anywhere to up to five years, sometimes even longer to find a full-time position. Not everybody wants to find a full-time position. There are many people who are happy doing private practice work and taking on short-term contracts and all that jazz, which honestly can be amazing. 
and it can be a great way to do your career, but it's not as stable and it's also not for everybody. Just like a museum position isn't for everybody. So you do have to be aware of that going into this field, that finding a job, even with a graduate degree from one of these amazing schools is not a guarantee. The field is constantly shifting, funding is constantly shifting, and unfortunately, sometimes conservation gets lost in that shuffle and jobs get cut, which sucks so much because there aren't so many. So that's important to note. You might have to move for a job. And that's the other thing is conservators move a lot. Um, not all conservators move all the time, especially if like you have a family or you have other obligations that you need to attend to in a specific location. That can make it a lot harder to one, find a full-time position, but also find internships and also stuff like that, like go to school. And so I know people who in the last seven years have moved six times. Like one of my mentors, I think moved like four times in like two years. Like it's, it's a lot. Personally, I think I've moved five times in the last five years, like once a year, almost. Like it's a, it's a lot and it's not for everybody. And it honestly, it's really, it's, it's a lot on the wallet and moving to a new place where you don't, where you know very few people or nobody can be really stressful and can be really taxing on your mental health. And you need to be able to look in yourself and say, is this job opportunity worth it? Can I do this? And one of the reasons I'm even in New York right now, um, one, there's amazing opportunities here, but also I have people here that I know and love. And after being in a pandemic, I, I really needed to have a support system. So I'm super lucky to have that right now, but that's just part of the job. The other part um, that really kind of sucks is romantic relationships. And I'm not going to get into this too much because can, this can get very personal. I'm not going to talk about my specific romantic relationship. It's hard to keep a long-term relationship up when you're pre-program and early career because you move. You move all the time, okay? And I know people who have amazing partners who are, are like, you know, super supportive and have an amazingly paying remote job where they can just like pick up and like go to Denver for four months and it's cool, you know? But that's not everybody. A lot of people do long distance and a lot of people are like, I'm not gonna date until I get a full-time job, which kind of sucks. Um, so that is something to be aware of, especially if you're somebody who really wants to start a family and that's your priority. Conservation can be a difficult road to do that. I, mean, I know many conservators who had kids in grad school, had kids right out of grad school, you know, we're just totally fine and totally chill. It's just one of those things that you need to be aware of when pursuing this career is that that can be really difficult to attempt to do those two things at the same time. So just be aware of that. Obviously life happens in, in many different careers, but, but this one specifically can be, can be difficult with complicated interpersonal relationships and building a family. The other thing is the money. Um, the pay is not stellar. Of course, we talked about low paying or un unpaid internships. We talked about potentially a funded program versus a non-funded program. And even if you are in a funded program, it's not like, it's not a ton of money. It's a, it's a nice chunk of change, especially when you're in grad school. I'm very grateful to be in that position, but you're certainly not like making bank or anything. Um, fellowships can be pretty low paying and, and jobs can be pretty low paying too, especially because and I didn't get into this, but I probably should have. Conservation jobs normally are in big cities and they're expensive to live in. And oftentimes the rate of pay doesn't really match the place you're living. And that can be really, really tough. Again, that's when it's great to have, to be in a couple um, and have someone else help paying your rent. You're not gonna get rich doing this career, but also the startup cost of this career is also quite a lot. So again, knowing your finances, knowing that if this is something you can take on financially, figuring that out, figuring out how that's going to work is an important part of, of deciding to pursue this career. And just on the whole, conservation is one of those things that's amazing and people are so interested in it, but there isn't a lot of knowledge or awareness about the field. And so I often feel that conservators are sometimes passed over for certain things and not as valued um, as they probably should be, which leads to like people cutting programs or not paying us enough. And 
it just kind of sucks overall but that's why i have this youtube channel to, to show you all about conservation and show you how amazing it can be and get people interested in conservation get people interested in participating in art conservation and really celebrating history and art and protecting it as best they can out with the negativity let's talk positives because i do love this career and everybody who is in this career loves this career because if you don't love it leave <laughs> like there are other things you can be doing but yes this career is amazing for many many reasons one of them is you not you get to work with your hands but you also get to do research and present papers and be academic which is one of my favorite things i love working with my hands and i would never want to give up working with my hands i love hand sewing i love it so much but i also love research and understanding how things work and being able to use my brain in a problem solving, creative problem solving way to fix, solve problems that are, are wild and weird and crazy and wacky and wonderful. Like that's what conservation is. It's tedious hand skills and creative problem solving and a healthy heap of documentation. Like that's what it is. And that's what I love about it. Another amazing thing is the passionate, amazing, talented people you get to work with. Because this career, like because of all the cons I talked about, like people, People who are conservators want to be conservators and they're very passionate about what they do. And obviously personalities are different. Like you're not going to gel with everybody, but I found the people who work in museums are some of the most lovely, amazing people I've ever met. And we're there as a team on a mission to not only take care of this art, but to showcase it and to connect with the human beings who love it. And that's just amazing. And it can be really fulfilling, especially if you are working with different communities and they come in and they see their art and they just get so passionate about it. And it's amazing. It's just an amazing part of this field. I love my conservation colleagues. They are great. They're great. You also get to work with like super cool objects. Like I get to work on an 18th century tapestry. It'd be awesome. I get to see cool stuff every day. I am always getting excited about the things I get to work with. And I just, I love it. I love it. I, I always say like, I always love going over to my colleagues and talking about what they're working on because they're always working on something so, so cool and interesting. And I always, I call it peeping. I'm like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go peep the project. And they give me the lowdown. I just love learning about it. I love learning from them. I love seeing what they're working on. So yeah, it's, that's like one of the best parts of the job is, is the objects. And you just get to meet so many amazing people and go to amazing conferences and it really is a cool amazing career it's it's awesome and that's why people want to do it and that's why i want to do it but <laughs> this entire video like it's complicated it, i have a complicated relationship with art conservation i think everybody in this field field really does and you know not every job is going to be perfect it's still a job like you're not going to love everything about it and that's okay your life is it should work for you and if conservation is a part of that amazing if it's not great we need so many there's so many people in this world like we need we need everybody all different types of people in this world so i'll take a deep breath hopefully this video was helpful how to become an art conservator and sort of the pros and cons of this career and i um i hope i didn't overwhelm you it can be overwhelming it really can again marathon not a sprint take it one day at a time one foot in front of the other you're gonna be okay. And if you have any extra brain space after all of that, you can of course hit the subscribe button down below. Come back for my personal art conservation journey and story. Um, if you have a question, pop it down below. I will, if there's enough of them, we'll do a Q&A. Um, you can follow me along here. I'm gonna be doing more conservation content, but I also sew and make beautiful, wonderful things, um, which I like to show you on here as well and talk about weird and wacky dress history stuff as well. I love doing that. So you can subscribe. You can go visit me on TikTok and Instagram where I post content similar to this and content that is just off the wall sometimes. So yeah, you can do that. And otherwise, I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day or evening.